Alright y'all, DJ Hyphen, Jay Moore, Sunday Night Sound Session, right now we are sitting next to the legendary man himself, the uh, magnificent, Jazzy Jeff right over there, Jeff welcome to Seattle, absolutely man, are you enjoying yourself so far? Yeah, always, you live on the road though, so, yeah I do, yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, you still have favorite places and yeah. it's definitely one of my favorites, what are some of your other favorites? San Fran, yeah. I think every DJ has pretty much the, some of the same, you know, San Fran, you know, LA's cool, What's like your key to life on the road? Um, take enough stuff to make you feel like you're at home. So what is what are your three essential that you can't leave home without? Aside, not music related, obviously. Not, oh man, the music kills everything. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. Not music. Oh, yeah. Man. The three I things think they that might, you... they might all be music related. Um, yeah, everything is everything is, is a Okay, so, so what are the three so, essentials that you got to leave? Um, well, I always take a movie drive. Okay. Um, you know, computers are essential. You don't even have to name that. But you always take a movie drive or just movies just in case it's nothing on TV. Um, I take a portable speaker just to kind of be able to, you know, listen to some music. Um, yeah. And, you know, your, your iPad, iPhone. Okay. And I always, I always take my studio stuff, you know, but that's essential too. No what kind of stuff do you listen to like on your own like obviously you're a professional DJ so you know you're doing this for a living playing music all the time so when the party's over what kind of stuff are you just relaxing to um you know it's crazy like maybe for like the past two years I'll get on a record and I'll stay on the record for three months and that'll be the only thing that I listen to so what's that record right now right now it's actually Chris Dave the drummer um, he has a mixtape called Drumhead Wow. Um, I'm I'm really doing some different stuff, <laughs> you know. That's cool. So it's like it was Robert Glasper, it was Esperanza Spalding for a minute, um, it was Kendrick Lamar, you know. Um, but it's just you know, it's almost like I think DJing, you play so many different kinds of music that I like my personal music to be not as confusing. No doubt. You know, because I already got a. You know, I think which every DJ has yeah. a little internal DJ in his head that just plays stuff in the middle of the night and just keep you up. So. so, so speaking of being on the road and traveling, to say like you had you were on the road and you're gonna be on the road for an extended period of time and you had like three essential albums that you could bring in just three those three albums, what those albums be? Couldn't do it. No, I know that's just like hypothetical. I, 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 I couldn't do it. You're not gonna um, have to ever do it, but. Robert Glasper's album. Okay. Um, the Roots album, anyone. No doubt. Um, boom. It's a tough question. Yeah, no doubt. There yeah, you go. Yeah. All right, so, so you're in town uh, judging the Red Bull 3 style, the West Coast Regional Finals tonight. Um, we actually talked a little bit on air last night about what you're looking for from the competitors. When you're out watching other DJs, I'm sure not necessarily judging them, but like, what do you look for in other DJs when you're out just trying to enjoy yourself? And you ever like catch yourself like, yo, that was a crazy transition that someone did, but like, you always, pick up on something. Always. I mean, you know, I think DJs have to get their inspiration from other DJs. You know what I mean? Like, um, cause, cause sometimes you have a tendency to second guess you know, stuff that you do, um, because you do it every night. Everybody there don't see it every night. So, you know, you're a lot of times you're your you're only worst critic. Um, but I like listening to DJs for the enjoyment of it. Like, you know, it's almost like how some people go to the movies to be a critic and because they're looking for what's wrong in the movie. Yep. I look for what's right in the movie and as well as a DJ. I'm not going to look for somebody who's bad. I'm going to look for whatever I can find good. Okay. Who are some of your favorites? Yeah, like, so who who are the DJs that inspire you? I know for um, you. I mean, it's so many. Um, Scratch Bastard in Canada. Um, uh, you know, Z Track. You know, A Track. Uh, you know, a lot. A lot are DJs that play. You know, I understand as DJs sometimes you have to play. You know, places that your job is to cater to the people. And the people may only want to hear one or two different types of music, and I understand that. But I, you know, when you have the DJs that can play in their own environment and do whatever they want, you know, and they kind of really go all over the place. Like that's, you know, not not only just those DJs, but 
you know, those parties, you know, that every, you know, what I tell people is every city has that party. You just have to go to the city and find out what night it's on and when you can go, you know, and that's one of the things that stuff like the do over and, and kiss and grind, you know, there are parties now that are going on around the country that just cater to music lovers and just whatever. Yeah, you're definitely one of my favorite DJ. You, I say that you, J Rock, and then I love Rich Medina. Too. Yeah, so yeah. Like, especially like you said on that vibe tip. You know, yeah, just their own yeah. thing. Because J Rock is the yes, he in is. terms of like he he's not he don't care. Yes, yeah. And, and you know what it is. And and I can be honest. Sometimes. Sometimes you're really on this, I don't care, and it's the most liberating thing in the world. But if you play too many, you know, things or, or, or events that are very confining, you start to lose that I don't care. You know, and it's interesting because the way that I kind of map my schedule out is, you know, I got a, I got a residency in Vegas that, you know, I can play a little bit more than the average person, but it's still kind of like, you know, that I'll pick my dates according to, okay, I've done five, six confining dates. Give me that free anything goes date. Cause it's kind of like your release, you know, that, you know, I get a chance to just go and dig and play whatever I want. Like you, you know, you long for those. Yeah. I think it's like a J Live bar, and he said something like, "Real DJs don't take requests." Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that statement? I, I mean, it's you know what? It's funny because he has a shirt that says that, and I have a no request shirt. Yeah. That is just kind of like, you know what I mean? It's you're not a jukebox. Yeah. Because you were hired for you're a reason. Not a, you're not a jukebox. Yeah. And you know what it is? It's just kind of like, you know, back in the days, you hired a DJ for a DJ to take you on a specific journey. And you fell in love with that DJ, depending on the journey that he took you on. You know, you know if this guy's gonna take you on a journey, you know, DV1 is gonna take you on a different journey, and Cuba's gonna take you on a different journey, and you just jump in the car, depending on where you wanna go. And now it's kinda like, I want everybody to go to the same place. You know, it's kinda like, you know, like the radio takes you on a journey too, you can just stay home. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, taking it back a little bit, when, did you realize um, at what point it should say that DJing for you could be a career or you wanted to, to become a career? Um, Do you remember that moment or that? Well, you know what? I think it, mine was a little bit different, you know, just starting off as a DJ. Um, you know, the, the early, early days of a DJ, you kind of wanted to align yourself with a rapper, you know. Um, and that's, you know, because there was no really big DJs just DJ, um, so you know, going from just being, you know, the biggest I can be in Philly to Will and I hook it up, and then it's kind of like, okay, now you have this group thing, and now you start to do this producing thing, um, and it was just out of the blue, you know. And I would make mixtapes, and you know, every once in a while, I'd show up to the club in Philly and do something, and somebody just called me maybe 15 years ago. I was just like, yo, you know, would you come to London and DJ? And I was like. You know, okay, you know, and I actually, you know, got on a plane, they set up a tour, and I got on the plane and went, and it was the most liberating thing, um, because, and this was really before the DJ craze, you know, the, 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 it, the big DJs were the house DJs, um, and I just kind of started following the path of the house DJs, just playing whatever I wanted, um, but just, you know, going... To, you know, overseas to these super clubs that it's 3,000 people and you're walking in and you're wondering, like, well, who's performing? And they're like, and that's you. It's like, 3,000 people come see you DJ, you know? Yeah. And and just going, it was the most liberating thing that, um, you know, my, it, it may have took about two or three trips. And I had a really, really successful production company, but it took about three trips. And I was like, I'm done. You know, because... It's funny to go that far in your career to realize that, like, wait a minute, you know, like, you can, you can have a, a career, to, you know, like, it, it, and I tell people, honestly, my career as a DJ over the past 15 years, way surpassed my artist career. Yeah. That's the thing. And people would never believe that. I think the thing that's interesting, too, about being a DJ is, like, that you, you're, 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 you're never dated, you know. Yeah. You, you have the ability to, as long as you're inspired, spin. You can spin till you're 60, 70. That's that, it. You know, 80, and you have a, a, a wealth of genre and historical 
reference to you can you can play records from 1930. You can play records that came out today. You can play something that's an exclusive. So you can that's the ill thing. Like Red Alert. You yeah, know, I mean it's you know it's music and it's just you know I think um, you know just it, it, the, the how big it's got because what I tell people is you couldn't tell me 20 years ago I really thought that you're gonna go to Vegas and you're gonna see Boys the Men. You're gonna see Key Sweat. You're gonna see Guy. You're gonna see LL Cool J. <clears throat> Cause it was just gonna be the new Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. You never in a million years did you go to Vegas and all you see is DJ. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. You know, sometimes you know I think it's the testament that you know the music industry kind of messed the music up to the point that now people don't want to invest in their favorite artists because you know my favorite artists have five great records I like. And why not just get the DJ that'll play everybody's great record? You know, and it's just, you know, it's clubs everywhere, and DJs everywhere. And, you know, and then it came out with that DJ list last year, and it was just kind of like, how much did he make? Like, as it did, you know, and, and I watched the whole, um, I watched mainstream start respecting DJs a lot more after that list came out. Yeah. You know, and it's, it sucks because it wasn't the respect over the music, it was just respect of, of how well the, you know, how well they were doing. It seems weird that, like, yeah, like you said, the DJs has have exploded in popularity, a lot of the EDM stuff catching mm -hmm. on over, over here, obviously it's been big overseas for years, but do you think it's interesting that within hip hop, like, it's almost like the DJs are, are more popular than ever, but not within hip hop? That, that was my biggest issue, yeah. you know, my biggest issue, you know, and I, and I said this uh, five, six years ago, that I don't understand why the biggest rock group in the world has a DJ in the group, but the biggest hip hop artist doesn't. Hmm. You know, and this, but you know what? As a DJ, you get to a point of, I, and, I, and I'm, a, I'm a hip hop head, I grew up with hip hop. You're gonna go where you're loved, you know, and you get to the point that if hip hop doesn't love the DJ, I'm gonna go where I'm loved. That's why I don't get mad at the EDM DJs. At the end of the day, I may not respect some of their talents, but you, you put it on the map. You put it on the map. Like, I don't understand how hip hop could be mad at that when it's kind of like, when's the last time you got love, you know? Yeah, they're not giving the space for the yeah, DJs. So absolutely. You, go you know, I gave mad respect to Kanye for hiring E Track, yeah. you know, because it was kind of like you actually put a real DJ, you know, and not only that, is you gave him some shine too. Mm -hmm. You know, you get some people that, they got a DJ on stage, but it's kind of like, <laughs> Just yeah. press some buttons. The, the yeah. gunshot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the replay. What do you think when uh, when you are mixing, would you prefer people to, I don't know, I've seen you a couple of times and I always see people just kind of standing and watching rather than like enjoying. That, no. So like, would you prefer, it's like, don't necessarily watch me, like you're here for the experience, you know, listen. It all depends on where you're playing. Yeah. You know, if you're playing somewhere, you know, if you're playing somewhere where it's, there, there are dates that you play that some of the focus is on you. It may be 50% focus on you, 50% focus on the crowd. Then I understand that. But if it's about the crowd, then, you know, yeah. it's, it's gotta be ear candy, not eye candy. Yeah. All right, let's go way back. Uh, we were just talking a second ago. I'm a huge Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince geek. That was my first ever album. Was he's the DJ, I'm the rapper. You mentioned it's the 25th anniversary mm -hmm. of it, so there's all sorts of uh, stories coming out. You said in Philly yeah. about that, but take us back to when you first met Will. I've heard you tell this story a couple of times. It sounds like it's kind of a little bit of a happenstance uh, on the initial call. Like someone might have been sick. You were filling yeah. in. Yeah. I mean, and that's just how fate works. Yeah. You know he. I got a call the last minute that somebody on 59th and Woodcrest is having a house party and they need a DJ. And, and what year was this? Uh, 85. Okay. Um, and because it was last minute, I called the guy that emceed for me and he was nowhere to be found. Because this wasn't pagers, this wasn't cell phone. <laughs> if he wasn't in the crib, he wasn't there. So I called him and didn't get him. Didn't, you know, no answer machine. His mom said he wasn't home. Um, so I went, you know, I, you know, went up, took my speakers and got up there and, you know, and it was ha just happened to be on his block and he, you know, came down, yo, what's up, man? You know, cause we knew of each other. 
Um, and he asked, you know, hey, man, where's Ice? And he's like, I can't find him. He's like, yo, you mind if I get on the mic? And, you know, got on the mic and it was just a natural, it was, it was a natural DJ MC chemistry. Any DJ that has ever really DJ for a rapper, you know, kind of knows, you know, a rapper's punchline a lot of times comes on the fourth bar, you know, and just the natural knowledge to drop out the fourth bar so he can get his punchline off and then do an intro scratch to bring it back. It was just natural DJ MC chemistry, you know. He would let you cut something on one side and before he tells you to do something else, he would let you bring it in and get set up on the other side, which is natural MC DJ, you know, uh, you know, camaraderie. And it was just, it was dope, you know, and I'm like, wow. You know, the night ended and I was like, yo, I gotta, I gotta do the YMCA in West Philly tomorrow, what you doing? It's like, you know, and that's how it happened. It was just week after week after week. So what made it take it from the parties into the studio to start making some original records? Well, I mean, you know, everybody back then, you know, there wasn't a lot of records. You know, the, the biggest dream was to be a DJ. You wanted to do all the parties. You wanted to do the proms and the after proms. You know, you wanted your name to just resonate that you're one of the main DJs in the city. It was very few people making records. You know, I think at that time, you know, School D had out a record. Um, you know, it, you know, it was, it was, it was a few. Um, but Will used to do "Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble" off of "Moments in Love." Like I would play the whole instrument on "Moments in Love," and he would say the whole rap of "Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble." And I used to watch him have hundreds of people hanging on every word because it was a story. Yeah. And they would just sit there and look, and you know, he'd say something, they'd laugh, and he'd be like, "Oh, oh you know." And I was like, "Man, that you know, we need to do something." So I actually made a beat and. He rapped over it, and it was just kind of for us messing around on a four track. And he actually took it to the guys who ran Pop Art, who Steady B and all the rest of them were on. And he called me one day and was just like, "Yo, they coming down and they want to put the record out." You know, it was like, you know what? I'll be able to tell my kids one day I made a record. So you didn't think it was going to lead to anything more than I, just the record? I didn't think it was going to lead to anything for maybe. We were on a tour. Yeah. We were on a tour and signed to Jive, and every th everything that we did, I said it was our last. <laughs> we got to LA, man, taking all the pictures we can, because we ain't never coming back here. We went to London, oh man, this is great, I got the, the London Bridge, we ain't never coming back here. Like, it literally yeah. went to, we started winning awards and getting plaques, and it was like, maybe I'm going to go back. You know, like, you, you just didn't... Because no one was striving for that. That was unheard of. Yeah, I mean, you broke down the barrier so, with the Grammys. I saw you mention that, you know, about the receiving the first Grammy for mm -hmm. hip-hop. You know, it's black history and just music history. Yeah, yeah. And, but you know what it is? It's, it, it's not music history to me. Yeah. It's not black history yeah. to me. Like, you know, it, it's, it's me who you're talking about. So I'm kind of like, man, I, <laughs> like, did it really have that kind of social relevance? You know, was it really that important, you know? Because for years and years, you never looked at it like that. You know, you don't, you don't think anything that you're doing is important until after it's done. Yeah. Well, it's a different time too. Like these days, you know, you can put out a record and you can instantly see people all over the world reacting to it online. Like I was a six, seven, eight year old, and like I was saying, riding the school bus in Texas, like reversing the cassette. You yeah. guys had no idea that I was listening to it, that you were reaching yeah. like me at, as at you know, yeah. in Texas at somewhere. All. I mean, because you know, we didn't have social media or anything like that. I was telling somebody the other day that when we were on tour, when we were on tour doing that record, we we started to be able to tell that the chairs got louder every night. You know, and then we're tripping, you know, like, yo, is it me or did it, you know? And one and just one show, Will was like, I'm gonna try something and you know, he said the first verse of Pastor Summer Stan, he said the second verse, you know, I'm going to say the first line and I'm going to let you say the second one, which was dangerous because it was like, if they don't say nothing back, ooh. And he said it and 25,000 people said it back. And then that became in the show, you know, and then because, you know, you don't, you don't get a chance to listen to radio when you're on tour, you know, especially back then, there was a tour bus. We'd go on the bus, check in a hotel, go eat, go do sound check, go eat, do the show and get on the bus and go to the next city. And that was for four months. So all we knew was like, okay, we were the second act to go on, and then they moved us to the third act, and then they moved us to the fourth act, and then they moved us right before Run DMC, you know, 
And it's kind of like, okay, the chairs are getting bigger, people are singing a record, and they just slid us all the way back. They can't put us before Run DMC because it's their tour. But it was just kind of like, wow, you know. And I'm sitting there like, can you imagine if we had Twitter? <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> you know. We're going to wrap it up, um, let you get into uh, the evening uh, here out in Seattle. Last question would be, aside from touring and performing, uh, what are you working on currently? Uh, just finished up an album with a young lady from Canada named Aya. Um, hope to put that out. Getting ready to start an album with a guy from Philly named Dosage. Um, and just, you know, putting out mixtapes. We got an online series that we're, you know, possibly going to put on television called Vinyl Destination that just kind of covers all of us traveling and, you know, just experience that DJs have around the world, food and shopping and, you know, culture. Um, so that's pretty much it. Nice. Well, thanks for coming yeah, through. Appreciate the time, Definitely as always. Good. Check him out when he's in your city. The magnificent Jazzy Jeff. Thanks, man.